Well, today we're very fortunate to have uh, Professor Kerry Emanuel. He's, uh, after 40 years of teaching, 40 plus years of teaching at MIT, he's become a professor emeritus uh, last uh, June or before that. Uh, Kerry's one of the most, uh, if not the, the most, pro prolific and influential researchers in uh, the atmospheric sciences. Um, I counted roughly 280 uh, research articles, four books, and uh, astronomical uh, publication uh, statistics. Uh, he's won many prestigious awards, has received many accolades, uh, all deserved. Uh, in uh, 2006, he was named uh, one of Time Magazine's uh, 100 uh, most influential people. And uh, Kerry, is, in his modesty, is quick to add that uh, Osama bin Laden was also on that list. <laughs> <laughs> Um, he's a member of the uh, U.S. National Academy of Sciences, uh, the American Philosophical Society, and a foreign member of the Royal Society. And today he's going to speak uh, on what sets the climatology of High Cape. So without further incursions into his seminar time, I yield the floor. <laughs> it's very nice to see. Oops, is that on? It may have got turned off when I put it in my pocket, so I'm going to do it really slowly. All right. Is that OK? Yeah. OK. So let's just get into it. I added an adjective to the title that went around, which is high. I'm really interested in this talk in what, wh why we see large values of cave when we do, where we do, and so forth. And it's a very important ingredient in severe convective storms, like hail storms in particular. Why should we care about this? Um, there is a significant cause of damage and loss of crops around the world. Uh, hail losses are second only to flood losses in Switzerland, I found out when I was there in December. So they're very concerned about it. They have whole academic departments that look at it. Comparatively, little is known about how climate change affects this weather hazard. And this is a big deal. And it's, um, Chris Davis and I were having a discussion about the lack of intersection between the weather community and the climate community kind of hurting us in this regard, that we, uh, we're not really um, very confident about using global climate models, for example, to predict the incidence of hail storms or severe convective storms. Um, CAPE, or convective available potential energy, is an important ingredient in most, not necessarily all, severe convective storms. And so understanding its climatology is, I would argue, really understanding the climatology, the physics behind it, is a step toward quantifying current and future convective storm risk. And that's really where my current interest lies. I think um, some very spectacular work has been done, especially here, about the dynamics of severe convective storms. And it's uh, still some very interesting work to be done, but it's, it's a beautiful scientific story. And I won't go there today. I'm just really interested in what controls the long-term statistics of such storms uh, from the point of view of estimating long-term risk and how that would change. So let's begin at the beginning, in a sense. I like to think of, I'm always, I always use opportunities like this to talk about this. Um, I like to think of moist convection as falling into two broad categories. Um, Quasi-equilibrium convection, uh, which is convection in which, to a good approximation, collectively the convective cells are consuming available energy at the rate that the large scale is generating it. And um, most tropical convection, 
and a lot of convection at higher latitudes in summer, for example, or convection over land in the tropics is of this kind. It's generally benign. It's not usually responsible for a lot of severe weather. It's responsible for a significant fraction of global mean annual mean rainfall. It's most of the rain globally that comes from convection comes from this kind of convection. Um, over land, the diurnal cycle is too fast for quasi-equilibrium. That's been demonstrated. So you have a kind of a large quasi-equilibrium. Uh, quasi and there is some diurnal buildup and exhaustion of CAPE enough to give you thunderstorms, for example, but not usually the severe kind. So the second type, I sometimes refer to as stored energy convection. It's the kind that is most frequently treated in undergraduate textbooks. It's what students learn first. I think this is a big pedagogical mistake, by the way, but it's what they learn first. And then they think it's global, and it isn't. Um, convective available tension energy builds up over time, and then it's suddenly released. It's comparatively rare. I mean, not altogether rare, but over the whole planet, it's, a, it's an infrequent uh, thing. But it is responsible for most of the convection-related risks, like hail, uh, tornadoes, flash floods, uh, sometimes straight-line windstorms. I don't need to tell this audience that, but um, the fact is it's that second kind. So the first kind, I thought I'd illustrate with a photograph. Uh, which was taken in the Seychelles Islands near the equator in the South Indian Ocean. And this is sort of a very typical skyscape. You see a lot of convection. It's not very strong, but it does produce rain. These convective clouds aren't very tall, but there are taller ones in the distance. They're kind of ubiquitous over much of the tropical ocean and very rarely produce lightning. And, uh, I like to say that's why pictures like this are why some of us become tropical meteorologists, if you don't mind me having robbed a phrase from Proverbs somewhere along the line. Um, and if you look at a sounding, uh, you typically see something like this, a very moist adiabatic uh, atmosphere, very moist all the way up. This is a sounding from Majuro in the tropical Western Pacific. Back in August of 2016, you could look a lot. I've spent many, many, many hours poring over soundings like this. And uh, where is the order in it? So you could, you could look at the lapse rate as being approximately pseudo-adiabatic. But if you look more carefully, it really depends on what your, what your thermodynamics are, what thermodynamic path you like to follow. So if we take air from near the surface, and raise it up a pseudoadiabat. That's this red dashed line. It's just a member of this family of red pseudoadiabats. It's positively buoyant through a lot of the trajectory. There's a, you know, not entirely trivial amount of cape associated with that. If you go up a reversible moist adiabat, on the other hand, that dark blue dots, and you'll notice they're right along the sounding. By the way, this is the virtual or density temperature, not the actual temperature, of the sounding and then all of the lifted quantities as well. So it really is an accurate uh, portrayal of the density along there. And the blue, light blue dots are an entraining plume model. And if you just pick the entrainment parameter exactly right, you can get a pretty good rendition of the sounding. But if you look at thousands of these, statistically, what you find is the tropical atmosphere over the oceans is almost exactly neutral to a, a reversible moist adiabatic process for, for a parcel lifted from the top of the mixed layer, not near the base. Why that's true hasn't really been solved. And who would think air going up a cloud is going up reversibly moist adiabatically? After all, we know the clouds in train for sure, right? That's the mistake I think we're making is thinking of clouds as homogeneous, and they're not at all. And some of us, and I, I included her in a wonderful talk earlier today from Jim Dye about measurements made with a glider, which has the virtue of flying pretty slowly through a cloud. You're able to get good measurements, and sure enough, there are samples that look like they're pretty adiabatic. I don't know how to resolve it. All I can tell you, you can try this, and I can give you the software to do it. It's not complicated. Um, it's just very, very uniform through the tropics that you lift air from near the top of the mixed layer. It's neutral to a re reversible moist adiabatic ascent. That's a profound thing, 
and yet we don't quite know how to explain it. Now, you don't have to even be a meteorologist, just a, somebody with a natural, naturalist inclination, when you look at a storm like this to know that you're looking at something quite different. It doesn't look like anything you see in the tropics. I can see Howie smiling and Morris smiling in front. Now, I finally got to your kind of convection, right? All right, so um, it's different. Um, it looks different. And if you look at the environment, uh, it's, it's quite different. Now, from a practical point of view, this, these are slightly old statistics. There are about 1,200 tornadoes on average in the United States every year. 60 fatalities, uh, 1,500 injuries, and about $400 million in damages. Um, what you might not know is that hail causes more than twice as much damage in the United States as tornadoes. It's a big deal. Typically, it doesn't kill people. It, uh, it does a lot of damage to crops. It's not nearly as frequently in the news. So anyway, um, hail is a big deal. And um, if you think. Um, a billion dollars a year is a bad thing. If that weren't bad enough, go to France. Eight million bottles worth of champagne grapes wiped out by a freak storm. Now you're talking a serious problem here. OK. Um, and if you look at the sounding, it's quite different. And the real difference uh, is that, first of all, the lapse rates tend to be steeper, particularly in the lower troposphere. And you have this capping inversion. It's dry adiabatic, at least during the daytime, usually below that. And so um, if you take a sample, it doesn't even matter so much which of these thermodynamic trajectories you follow, follow it up, um, there is, it's very, very buoyant through a deep layer. And that's the textbook example of conditional instability. There's no question there's a lot of cape. It doesn't really matter what thermodynamic diagram. In this particular case, if you were to convert all the pseudo-adiabatic capes to kinetic energy, uh, you have an updraft of 110 meters per second. So that's, you know, it's a lot of cape, right? So my issue is, my whole purpose of this talk is how does that come about? And I always thought I knew the answer to that. And now I think completely differently about the problem. So do stay tuned, all right? If you think you know the answer, uh, maybe you're, you're not alone, but certainly I thought I did. So how did these come about? Let's just look for a few clues in the climatology. I'm sure you know this for the US. This is a climatology of fairly large hail, more than um, uh, one inch. It's the number of days per year with that reported within 25 miles of point. But it, the point is, it's a creature of the plain states and maybe the south. Um, this is just looking at the time of year. It's creatures of the spring, particularly the late spring. Um, and if you look at the time of day, there's a very, very strong diurnal cycle in this, diurnal um, tendency. It's, they're they're uh, most probable in the late afternoon and early evening. And if you look at the climatology of tornadoes, um, time of day, local time, it's the same deal. It's mostly late afternoon. Some very interesting cases early in the morning, which we should come back to. But for now, I'll just leave that alone. Now, here's a map that I saw in a presentation by the late, great Ted Fujita back in the 1980s, which I never understood. And I couldn't understand why he made the map. So it's a global map. I don't know where he got the numbers. I just don't know where he got the data. He's not around to ask. Uh, the red dots are tornadoes reported in 1930 to 1985. I'm sure it's not a very accurate climatology, but it's probably and it's very gross statistics. And the green is called agricultural areas. I have no idea what metric he was using, but it's basically places where there are farms. And he'd put that up and say, tornadoes like farms. <laughs> really? <laughs> they really have it. Nature really has it in for farmers? I don't know. It always struck me. He put that up there, and he'd sort of smile and say, well, there's tornadoes like farms. I want you just to remember this map for a few minutes, OK? So um, I just want to emphasize that I think everyone here knows the necessary conditions for severe thunderstorms, high values of Cape. But there are interesting exceptions to that rule. And usually large values of uh, large vertical wind shear, particularly at low levels. But today, just to be very clear, 
I'm only going to be concerned with that and just try to tackle it one at a time and see where, where do you get large cape. So uh, in addition, we, there's a large recent but rapidly growing literature on um, what's happening to severe convective environments in models, climate models, for example. So observations and global models tend to show that CAPE is, is and probably will increase, as well as the convective inhibition. So here's a um, chart from North American reanalyses, I believe, Brian Tang and so forth. Trends 1979 to 2017, and it's a complicated measure of favorable environments for severe convective storms, not just CAPE. It's a sheer bunch of other parameters. And um, the stippling is where it's considered statistically significant. And you see big increases, uh, especially in the eastern portion of the, by the way, the black curves are the same metric, uh, I think, currently, OK? And then these are the, the shading, the coloring of the trend. So it seems to be an eastward or northeastward trend in this. There are lots of papers along the same lines. Uh, here is one that looks at kind of a double histogram of uh, CAPE in uh, a global model at the bottom, CCSM4, and in a regional model whose boundary conditions have been supplied from the global model. This is the WARF model. These are all, I'm sure, familiar to everybody here since they're NCAR models. And they're histograms, so their frequency of both SIN, convective inhibition, which is defined negative by the authors, I don't know if that's conventional or not, and CAPE, which is defined positive. And so you can see there, of course, there are far more instances of low CAPE and low SIN than the, than the reverse. Now, this is the difference between a control simulation and one called a pseudo-global warming simulation in which basically the initial and boundary conditions have been adjusted to the global climate model rendition in some future climate. And uh, you can see that the big changes are out here where the frequency itself is small. So that, again, is suggesting a tendency toward larger CAPE and maybe toward smaller SIN. Um, this is the same thing, but directly from the global climate model without this regional model in between. The climate model tends to have much more frequent values of high CAPE, probably because it's harder for the parameterization to release it whereas here it's explicit convection. But the same general uh, form of the tendency there. Um, I think I'll skip that one. So I would argue from everything I've shown you so far, the key questions I have is what determines the geographical distribution of these stored energy storms? That's sort of a baseline question. Why do these storms peak in the late afternoon and early evening? Why are, this is very important, why are the peak Cape values what they, what they are? They're sort of in the thousands of joules per kilogram, not some completely different number. What sets that number? What about nature sets that number? Why is it at 20,000 or 200? Okay, these are fundamental questions, I would argue, about this, this kind of problem. And, and then, of course, if you can answer these questions, you're in a position to say not only by using models that this might increase, but why it might increase. So the conventional view of how you get these environments, and this comes from my textbook, and I put that there deliberately because I think it's wrong, um, is, well, there's an element in this, right, is that you have air, an air mass that's modified by several days over a hot, dry desert. So there's no evaporation from the soil. You get very hot at the base. You build up a dry adiabatic, deep dry adiabatic layer. And then you physically advect that layer over higher theta E air, but much cooler air that's been modified by, say, its presence over the ocean. It's a superposition of those that give you that sounding. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, that's what I think most people believe. And um, I don't think it's right. The dry air part of it, I think, is right. The rest of it isn't quite right. And the first people, I think, in hindsight, that were on to the right thing were this group of uh, Tom, Toby Carlson, Tom Warner, and John Lenici. Um, this is way back in 1987. And they were using the predecessor, I guess it's the predecessor of the M-cubed model, Penn State NCAR 
regional model. Um, and the, the primary thing I've highlighted here is that, just as I said before, the dry soil conditions of northern Mexico are critical. They actually went in the model and moistened Mexico and got rid of the capping inversion that way. OK, that's part of the classical story, too. But look at this part. The variable soil conditions of the southern Great Plains are important to produce this sort of differential surface heating and instability through evaporation. And that's the part I want to talk about today, because that's, I think, what's really going on. It's all about the soil and the vegetation. It's all about that. And it's not so much about the Gulf of Mexico. In fact, there are parts of the world where you get very high cape where there's not the equivalent of the Gulf of Mexico. All right, so we came up, in fact, this is before I discovered this old 1987 paper. We had come up with this hypothesis relatively recently that large cape is produced when you take this deep, dry adiabatic layer formed over dry land and invected over moist soil. And I would say maybe moist and, some, and sometimes vegetated soil, and then turn on the sun, uh, sort of conceptually. So the picture, I'm trying to make this as simple as possible by the cartoon, is you start with this desert air. You have a dry diabatic, this is just temperature versus height. You have a dry diabatic lapse rate giving way at two or three kilometers, maybe a little higher, to a more standard lapse rate in the troposphere. Of course, eventually there's a stratosphere. You begin with that, and you just take that, and you put it over a moist soil. And conceptually, let's do that at night. There's no sun. But you have wind at the surface, and you form a presumably shallow, shear-driven boundary layer. And uh, if you assume very little heat storage in the soil, um, when you do form that layer, you preserve the moist static energy. There's no source of moist static energy from the ground to a good approximation. So you, you preserve the moist static energy, but you cool the air and you moisten it. And we do that until, until the air becomes saturated at the top of this new mechanical boundary layer. And if you then lift it right from the, anywhere in this mixed layer, it's assumed to be completely well mixed, you go up this moist adiabat, it has to, by, by definition, by the way we've constructed this, eventually asymptote to this dry adiabat. So you have kind of a lot of sin in here, but no cape. But then you turn on the sun. And what happens is this boundary layer grows, mostly by turbulent dry convection and entrainment, very classical problem, entrainment at the top of the boundary layer. And as it does so, it heats up. The sin uh, goes down, and the cape goes up. And if you think about it, the, the maximum cape will occur when you've just completely eroded that capping inversion, if you get that far in the cycle, presuming you get that far in the cycle of a day. So it's this difference, OK, between this sort of wet bulb temperature boundary layer and the dry desert air that determines the maximum value of cape you can generate with solar heating. And that difference, you probably may have already figured out, just scales as the Clausius-Clapeyron equation. And that's the first order of the answer, but there's a lot more to it than that, um, that why CAPE goes up with temperature. It's just the Clausius-Clapeyron scaling. Now, the problem with that is that you, depending on the conditions, you may never get to this point of warming the surface all the way up to this temperature, depending on conditions. So we're going to quantify that. I'm not going to bother you with a lot of math. But we're going to assume that this, this new boundary layer is always well negative, just the simplest possible 1D model. It's almost analytic. If you want the MATLAB code, happy to give it to you. It's really simple. Uh, we start with this dry adiabatic elevated mixed layer above the new boundary layer. And we, just to make things simple, assume that there's no moisture in it at all. No, we're, not we're not going for absolute realism here. And it gives way to a stable troposphere. Um, in the first round of this model, we, we assume uh, surface energy balance. There's no heat storage in the soil or the vegetation. But we relax that later by actually coupling this to a soil and vegetation model. Now, I've just said soil and vegetation, and I don't see any eyes closing yet. Please. <laughs> they would if I, if I were in the audience. 
I never used to think of this stuff as that important, and it's probably because I of, of something I missed in my education, but it's really important in this problem. You'll see that. So in this first round, we're going to, uh, of surface energy balance, we're just going to specify the surface moisture as a kind of a, just a fraction of what would be available if it were open water, just to specify that fraction. But later, we're going to not do that and predict it as a function of the time of day by coupling to the soil model. So we have just neutral aerodynamic sensible latent fluxes. You wouldn't want to do that if you wanted it to be completely accurate. You want to do something. And Doug Lilly's uh, formulation of, of uh, boundary layer top entrainment. So you have a negative buoyancy flux, which is just some specified fraction of the surface buoyancy flux. And, um, and then everything else is conservation of mass and moist and dry static energies. And we assume that the new mixed layer has this um, MSC of the desert air, but desert air has no moisture, so it's the initial dry static energy. And that, as I mentioned, it's just saturated at the top at sunrise. And then, um, of course, as the boundary layer grows, it entrains the desert air from above. So the key parameters are the elevated mixed layer potential temperature. It's just one number. Initial boundary layer temperature and humidity and depth of boundary layer. But we're coupling them in this approximation. We're tying them together by the assumption um, that the initial MSE is the same as the dry static energy of the desert air and that it's saturated at the top. So we're really just going to specify the boundary layer depth. Surface wind speed, it's a 1D model, turns out to be important. Fraction of the, of the saturated surface moisture that's available in the energy balance case, surface exchange coefficients, magnitude of time evolution and insulation. And then later when we couple to the uh, soil moisture, we introduce a whole bunch of new parameters. And this is what makes me uncomfortable. I would like to have a one parameter model, and even before we introduce the soil, as simple as I've made it, right? This, I think I can't make it any more simple. It's already complicated enough. Um, but adding all the soil is just, you know, it gets to be pretty uh, ridiculous. And it sort of tells me that there's probably some other ways you can simplify the system, but not that I've thought of so far. So we're going to impose a diurnal cycle of net surface radiation that, considered, that also includes IR. So it integrates to, this is just the surface radiation as a function of the time of the day, local time. It integrates to zero, so we don't have any net radiation over 24 hours. OK, so here's the kind of thing that happens with the energy balance model. Um, the sun rises. This is a graph of cape versus time. And um, you always see curves like this. About 10 in the morning, you start building up cape. And each of these colored curves is a different potential temperature of the desert air. We're holding the moisture availability fixed at 0.8, the surface wind speed at 8 meters per second. And we're going from desert air with a potential temperature of 294 in steps of a degree up to, up to 310, and, or, or 2 degrees. Um, now, these curves tend to peak and drop down. And I stop the integration when the sin goes to zero, because I'm not interested in the convection. I'm interested in the buildup of cape. Presumably, when the convection goes off, it starts to deplete the cape. I just want to know how you got the cape for this talk. Why, does it, why do you think it turns around and goes down? There's still radiation coming in. It's because the entrainment at the boundary layer top, which is entraining low uh, moist static energy air from them, is overwhelming the surface flux. And so it turns and goes back down. Now, the hottest temperatures for this combination of parameters, the sun sets before you've uh, exhausted the um, sin. So there's, uh, the atmosphere, in terms of cape, is all dressed up, but it has nowhere to go because the sin is not zero at sunset. Now, of course, it doesn't have to be completely zero to get convection. And this is the sin corresponding to those same curves. Um, this is at uh, high temperature, and this is at low temperature. So the sin also increases, everything else being equal as you increase the temperature. The sin goes up, the cape goes up. And I think it's a pretty simple picture of why. 
This is just the diurnal peak value picked off of each of those curves and put on a graph as a function of the desert air potential temperature. It starts going up as clausy as Clapeyron, but it stops when it becomes limited by the length of the day. Now, one thing you might be asking, I didn't mention this, is that as you warm the desert air, the cape peaks later and later and later in the day. Right? And eventually, its peak value is limited by the length of the day. And that's why this stops going up with clouds. But it, it covers a range of zero at 294, which is not that cold, right, for, say, early spring, to all the way up to almost 8,000 here um, for the highest desert. So it's a very, very sensitive to temperature. And that's why I think the bottom line is why you're seeing Cape go up in models. But it's more interesting than that, I would argue. This is just trying to take the solutions and looking at them a little bit more comprehensively. So this is the diurnal peak cape as a function of the desert air potential temperature. We've already shown that that goes up, but also of the surface wind speed. Now look at this, OK? For very, very low wind speeds, you get a lot of cape. And for very high wind speeds, you also get a lot of cape. And an intermediate is a minimum. So I want you to, if you're interested in this, be thinking about why that's so. Why is it not monotonic? By the way, what is the, why does the surface wind make any difference at all? In an energy balance model, the enthalpy coming out of the surface has to always equal the sunlight. It just does, right? Because you're not storing any, by assumption, you're not storing anything in the soil. It's the partition of that surface enthalpy flux into sensible and latent that's strongly affected by the wind speed, OK? That's why it makes a difference. The partition between sensible and latent, and we'll come back and see why, it makes a huge difference in the buildup of Cape. This is just looking at another two parameters. So this is, again, desert air potential temperature. This is alpha, the soil moisture availability. If it's dry, Nothing happens. You don't get any cape. And it's pretty linear, or pretty monotonic, anyway, in both of these variables. You get larger cape uh, for a moister boundary layer, but you also get larger sin. Why is that? If the boundary layer is relatively dry, there's a lot of sensible heat flux. The boundary layer deepens rapidly and trains a lot of low moist static energy from the troposphere and damps the buildup of cape that way. If it's very moist, you get little, not zero, but you get little sensible heat flux. The boundary layer doesn't grow very much in the day, and you build up a lot of moist static energy. And you still have a lot of sin because you, know, you haven't got rid of the temperature deficit of the boundary layer. So now I'm going to, if that weren't bad enough, I'm going to couple it to a soil model. Now here I'm frankly venturing pretty far away from my expertise. I have. Uh, it's taken me uh, all these decades to get, finally get my hands dirty in the soil. But it turns out to be interesting. I've had a lot of help from, uh, from people who are experts in this. But it's very hard today to find a simple 1D soil moisture. There are lots of complicated models with many, many layers. I had to kind of root around. And I'm using one developed by two French scientists way back in 1989. It's basically two layers, the surface of the soil in a kind of a root cell that, you, uh, that you're solving for. Um, so the surface and root zone variables that we're concerned with the temperature and volumetric moisture content. And the key soil variables include porosity. <laughs> you can see where the parameters are multiplying. Thermal conductivity, heat capacity, transmission of water through the soil, vegetation color, uh, cover, and variables controlling transpiration from plants. And it makes a huge difference. And it makes me very nervous to see this plot um, and the ones like it. So what is this? We're going to hold everything constant of, along the lines of what I was just talking about with surface energy balance. The wind speed's constant. Alpha's constant. Same sunlight. Holding the potential temperature of the desert air constant. And all I'm varying is the kind of soil. Now this, by the way, is, con is for the case of bare soil. Is that right? Um, yeah, this is no, vegeta no vegetation, I think. Um, and this is incorrect. This is not cape and sin. It's just cape. So this is uh, down here. Um, we have clay, 
and clay-like soils up there, we have sand. Right? Everything else is the same. We went from nothing to a lot of cape. All right? Because of its control of the Bowen ratio and to some extent how much heat in the course of a day gets stored in the soil. But the main thing is that we're now allowing water to evaporate from the soil and potentially deplete the soil. So in the clay cases, what's going on here is you've got plenty of water because you specified it in the morning on the surface. It rapidly evaporates, but water doesn't come up very fast from below to replace it, not fast enough. And so you're water limited. And the, the, basically, your Bowen ratio goes to infinity. Well, not to infinity, to one, depending on how you define it, very quickly. And there's no cape to speak of built up. All right? So it could be very wet in the morning, but if it's dry underneath or the soil is not very porous, uh, you lose all the water in the course of the day. Now we're just varying um, the coverage of vegetation and holding out everything else constant. So it varies from no uh, vegetation down here to 100%. Of course, uh, for a particular specification of the characteristics of that vegetation makes a big difference. Um, here we're just looking, varying the amount of water that's in the soil in the root zone. This is, where, this is what's being transpired to the atmosphere, to a first approximation, through plants. This doesn't matter if there aren't any plants. Well, it actually does, because the water does percolate up through the soil, but not very much. Again, you know, it just varies a hell of a lot. Um, OK, finally, um, I'm going to look at some, I'm going to show you some work I've been doing with an MIT graduate student I've been working with just trying to look at what we see now in observations. And what we're looking for are episodes of high cape. OK, that's all. We are not looking whether any severe weather resulted from that. It's not a concern in this project. It's just how you got the high cape. And we find cases, and then we use a North American reanalysis, which has the virtue of relatively high resolution in time and space, and we're following parcels back, uh, an ensemble of parcels that have slightly different endpoints, but all within this box that you see here. And uh, I realize now that I remember being told that the people who are assigned in remotely can't see that laser. So I'm going to try to switch to the box. Uh, so we're going to trace back from there. And um, the red our boundary layers trace back, I think, 72 hours. So they're all sort of coming from the south or south-southwest. They might have been over the Gulf of Mexico uh, a day earlier than that. And then these sort of green-yellow trajectories are what wind up in the capping inversion. And in this case, and the colors are the altitude and pressure, if you will, above the surface. So these parcels are descending and winding up in the inversion. So they're warming by descent, but also because they came from elevated deserts in the southwest and northern Mexico. So this is, looks a little bit like the canonical accepted paradigm here. OK, but if you actually look at the moist static energy in the boundary layer, it's telling you something a bit different. So first of all, this is just quantities along those trajectories, or a mean of the trajectories going back three days from the time of very high cape that we observe in the reanalysis. The red is cape. The blue is five times the sin, just so you can sort of see it, if you will. Don't worry about the dashed lines for now. And you can see the cape is sort of building up over three diurnal cycles, ending up at a fairly large value at the end. And the sin also has, of course, an out of phase diurnal cycle and winds up close to zero. But the red curve in this middle diagram is the moist static energy of the boundary layer. And you see it starts off fairly low and rises appreciably while the sample is over land. If you didn't have that rise in moist static energy over three days of that sample being over land, you wouldn't have high cape. It's not just air conservatively advected from the Gulf. OK. Now here's a very different case, same kind of diagram. The high cape is way off to the east in this case, over, I think, Ohio or someplace like that. Um, again, we're going to look at this ensemble starting 
from this very high Cape region going back in time, the boundary layer parts will stay in the boundary layer and execute practically a circle in this case. They were never over water, not for a very long time. But the air forming the capping inversion is also coming from northern, like before, from northern Mexico and the desert southwest. And that's kind of a universal in this. Um, so like the previous case, this is the Cape evolution. There's a lot of sin in this case. Remember, we're multiplying it by five, though, compared to the Cape. And you can see that most of the Cape built up in the last 12 hours. Okay? There wasn't much along the parcel, some, the few days up to that. And the moist static energy just shows that. It's, it actually falls initially, and then it comes up. There's no influence of any of open water on these trajectories over this period of time. So armed with this, and I emphasize this is kind of preliminary. We're in the middle of all this. And I'm actually here to get your feedback. It's very important. Can we begin to explain the existing, the today's climatology of High Cape? Okay. And so what I'm showing you here is a map I couldn't have shown you uh, 10 years ago. It's a, it's a short-term climatology of surface soil moisture from satellite. And this is an amazing technical advance that not too many people in our field seem to know about. So this is a map of surface, just surface soil moisture, not soil moisture below the surface, from April 2015 to March 2021. It's the best climatology we have almost at present. And um, the yellows are dry soil, the blues are moist soil. And what we would argue is you're going to see high cape buildup in a kind of rough qualitative sense, where you have um, dry soils upwind, up the climatological wind anyway, from moist soils. So you can start looking at that map. Remember, you've got westerlies sort of north of 25 degrees, or poleward of 25 degrees. Easterlies below that. I can see I can see some of you doing mental calculations of where this is happening, so I'll, I'll let you do that. But, um, well, one region is obvious is the what we already know to be true is the plains of the U.S. You've got all this dry soil. By the way, of course, it varies. The exact nature of it will vary from year to year. I haven't shown you any of the variants of this. But broadly speaking, it's Canada, um, the US, and Canadian plains. Basically, westerly winds uh, going from dry soils to moist. The Pampas of uh, South America is another prominent place. You have an elevated plateau. It's pretty dry. Um, the western Pampas. And then as the air, as you go east, you get into quite moist soils down uh, in Argentina, for example. Um, Southeast Australia, maybe not to the same extent. Um, you have uh, dry soils off to the west, kind of a moist coastal plain. Um, northern India and Bangladesh, at least if you have west-northwesterly winds at certain times of the year, it's going from the high deserts of the Middle East over very moist low delta um, areas. China. Um, from the, from the uh, steppes, if you will, down into the moist coastal plain. Um, equ Eastern equatorial Africa is interesting. You've got easterlies now, and you've got deserts of Somalia and the high dry plateau of Kenya there, giving way to the very, very wet jungles of the Congo, for example. And this, uh, you may, some of you may know, is the lightning capital of the planet not including the, the uh, Maracaibo region of Venezuela. And Europe, if you, have, if you have situations synoptically where you have a block or so and you have a lot consistent flow from the south or southwest, you're bringing air from the deserts of North Africa over relatively wet soil. Um, southeastern, to a lesser extent, southeastern South Africa. So these are known places, and I return to Fujita's map. And so I think maybe Fujita knew something we didn't know in the 1980s. It's all about soils, which of course agriculture also is. Okay, that's pardon the pun, food for thought. I hope. Okay, it's about agriculture. So let me summarize. 
this is our hypothesis. I've shown you what evidence I think we have for it. Uh, large cape occurs when deep, dry adiabatic layers are infected over moist and or vegetated soils. And that may provide the connection to agriculture. It's not about farms, per se, just agriculture, arable land. Um, if it weren't for the diurnal cycle, there, we, I think we showed back in 2017, the scaling of peak cape is, is Clausius clapron. It goes up very fast with temperature. But that's limited in reality by the fact that the day is a finite length. And um, as you make it hotter and hotter, it takes longer and longer to achieve these peak cape values until you hit sunset, right? And then they, that's it. The diurnal peak values of Cape increase monotonically with the potential temperature of the desert air. And also with, um, but peak Cape increases with surface wind speed and soil moisture, but it's also large for very low wind speeds. So there's a nonlinearity there. Um, coupling to soil thermodynamics and vegetation physics is important, I would argue. And that means that if we're going to get the climatology of severe convection right in climate models, whether it's the present or the future, I would argue that we're going to have to get that right. The problem is up until recently, we didn't know when it was right because measurements of soil moisture until recently were very sparse compared to the scales and homogeneity of actual soils. But now we have satellite data that can tell us that. The dependence on the soil moisture, I think, this is just a hypothesis, might offer some degree of seasonal predictability of CAPE. If you know the root zone moisture, if you could find out that out in the beginning of the high CAPE season, it might tell you, you know, comparing it from one year to the next or one year to climatology, it might tell you something about the uh, activity of, uh, of uh, deep convection that year especially if you can account for some of the other factors like shear. Um, agricultural and other land use practices on regional scales might alter the severe convection climatology. It's a very interesting question to me whether we've already done this. I mean, large swaths of the plain states are heavily irrigated and farmed. They weren't before, right? On such a large scale that at least from what I've seen so far, it had to have altered the climatology of severe storms, probably in, in the direction of having more of them, right? Because you're, make, you're making the soils wetter. Um, and if you were magically, as long ago Tom Warner and, and company showed, if you were to magically uh, uh, irrigate all of northern Mexico and New Mexico, you might get rid of a lot of the severe convection because you get rid of the cap, which is what's allowing the energy to build up. So global model climatology is likely to be sensitive to soil moisture and soil precipitation feedbacks. Global warming increases cape, uh, unless previously moist soils dry out too much. That's another factor in climate change, of course. And the final point is we really ought to develop uh, improve severe weather proxies that we can apply to climate models um, or regional models driven by climate models to use in assessing current and future risks of convective storms. And I want to say how very important a lot of us think that is. The weather people, if you will, who study severe storms, we've got to have a, a new generation who's interested in the long-term risks of these and how they're evolving. And I don't think that's going to come from the climate community down. It might. It's probably going to go from the weather community up. So uh, I think that's all I had. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. OK, uh, Morris, we'll give you. Yeah, of course. <laughs> no, I. I, I... My only question is, um, you know, I certainly understand what you're presenting in terms of just the dry moist, but I've always thought that it's the elevated terrain to the west that's just as important to just the dry moist, that you have an elevated heat source, uh, which produces the capping or the warmer right. inversion. And that's yeah. certainly true in the US and in 
Argentina, right? Right. So how much of it, you know, is it really true that if we just, you know, irrigated the Rockies, this would go away? Well, all I can point to is Tom Warner's paper where they did that in a model and it did go away. And I don't think they changed the elevation. But you have a point, and it's kind of why I said potential temperature. So if you, if you do, we've done this, if you do a RC, radiative convective equilibrium, just a single column calculation in a given climate, and you do your, do the elevate, do the, you know, whole temperature profile coupled to the surface, and then all you do is elevate the surface, nothing else, same sunlight, same greenhouse gases. And uh, you elevate the surface, the potential temperature goes up. And so from that thermodynamic point of view, it's an important influence on the potential temperature. So I'm going to take yeah. a few of these Slido questions. OK. Screen here. Why moisture ascent is reversible in the tropics? That is the $1,000 question. It's a wonderful question. I beat my head against that for 30 okay. years. I don't know. OK. Um, the second question. Well, OK. <laughs> we'll go through there quickly. All right. Okay. Yeah, we got to go. Yeah. Okay. This is from Kevin Trenberth. Two questions. You never mentioned the role of the Rockies or topography. Yeah. And two, what, what about heterogeneity of soils, especially the role of ponds, lakes, rivers, et cetera? Yeah. Uh, I think I answered the first part of the question when I answered Morris's. The second part is that it's very important on scales large enough to really affect the boundary layer of moist static energy along these parcels. So yes, I mean, as a 1D model, uh, basically assuming homogeneous, in reality, you actually absolutely have to put in those, all those factors. OK, next question is uh, two questions. Uh, Amanda, Justine, so uh, is there a feedback between cape and moist soil? More cape equals more precipitation equals higher soil moisture. Uh, one. OK. And you want why, me to why, why do fluxes over moist soil more than over water, like the Gulf? Why OK. Matter more? Right, I'll try to be fast. Um, is there a feedback? Well, I don't know if CAPE necessarily means, in a climatological sense, more precipitation. There's more SIN, too. It means more intense convection when you have it. It doesn't necessarily mean more convection. So I wouldn't necessarily make that the second part. Uh, the, the problem with water is that there's no, di to a first approximation, no diurnal cycle. The diurnal cycle is critical. That's why you need the land. Right. Uh, no, because like the quiz show here. Next question <laughs> is, uh, Can, do I get to choose door number two? <laughs> Next question is why sometimes there is few cape and there are so many tornadoes. Okay, well that's that's an excellent question. It does happen. Um, it happens commonly in hurricanes. If you have a large amount of shear uh, and a lot of dynamics going on, you don't need a lot of cape. But uh, but this was a talk about high cape and not necessarily about the convection that follows. Well, thank you. It's a fascinating talk. I have a, um, read a paper once by Roger Peelke years ago about his replacing the, um, the current land use with the land use 100 years ago and found that it had a profound effect over, uh, on convection over Oklahoma uh, with there being more convection in the modern period. Now, this could be a different scale, though. I'm just pointing out that local, where you have variations in soil moisture, where you have variations in crops and so on, you get local gradients, and that could explain it in his case. But certainly, it's a big effect. The second thing is a question I have. Um, what kind of entrainment? I, I don't remember Lily's. Uh, it was, you said it was a fraction of the surface. Buoyancy flux, yeah. Buoyancy flux, so you didn't take wind into account there. Well, the, the wind will affect the buoyancy flux oh, sure. through the aerodynamic right. formulas, yeah. But, it also, but there's an additional factor yeah, so, there that might so make it more complicated. Basically, the assumption is that the moni novikov length is a lot less than the boundary layer depth. So all the con turbulence at the top is convectively generated, yeah. Yeah. Hail is uh, prevalent in Europe. As you mentioned, Switzerland, Italy, France, et cetera. And you did show a dry area over Africa, hmm. but um, air trajectory calculations would really maybe help unravel whether your theory would apply more generally. So um, the student 
um, PJ Tuckman, a great student, is in the process of doing just what you suggest. He's taking what we did over the US and using the, the ERA5 reanalysis, which has about enough spatial and temporal resolution. He's doing just that. How yeah. confident are we in, in the increase in CAPE in the central US over the last 40 years? Like, I looked at this in several reanalysis data sets, and you can get all kinds of answers. Yeah, not confident at all. And I would say that all I'm, I mean, the main point was, I, did, I showed you the climate models too. The preponderance of these things show, at least in the future, an increase. The reason I'm not confident in all of it, it's sort of backward reasoning. It all depends on vegetation and soil. And I don't know enough about the models or the observations that are based of soil models that are in climate models. I have to really spin myself up on that. <coughs> And be, but right now, because I don't know, I'm not confident. Not to mention, you don't know the vegetation of the people. That's right. I mean, but these models try to predict that, some of them, anyway, as far as I understand. Whether they're any good at it, I don't, we'll see. But I won't see. Some of you will see. <laughs> Jerry, I wonder if you're downplaying the importance of an upstream body of water like the Gulf yeah. of Mexico. I mean, you wouldn't have uh, really moist soil Right. If you didn't have the upstream uh, body of water, yeah. and that the temperature of that upstream body of water would probably be, should probably be very important too. Yeah, I would think. Yeah. Um, so absolute, absolute point, and I didn't didn't want to suggest that that isn't true. It's just that it wasn't important for what happens in sort of approximately to the, you know, within a few days of the convection. Why you have wet soils is absolutely dependent on things like that. I think the counterexample is the pampas. You have the desert, but the moist air isn't coming off the Atlantic most of the times, the way I understand the project that just is coming off the moist soils further to the north. So, um, and those, of course, are you know ultimately the water vapors coming from mostly the Atlantic there. Yeah, if okay, you took so away uh, that, it wouldn't happen. We have a question here from Jared Lee. A fascinating talk. I have uh, more of a comment uh, than a question. And Raoul, we're working on a project that now assimilates and imposes SMAP uh, soil moisture into WARF compared against USCRN in, uh, I don't know what these things are, maybe you do, um, in situ soil moisture OBS. Our efforts have been uh, more focused on dust aerosol impacts, but I'd be uh, fascinating to examine CAPE too. Terrific. To comment. Yeah. And I think we got one more question from the back. And this will be the last one. Hi. Uh, hi, thank you very much. Uh, it's a really fascinating talk and a great theory. So uh, I'm a lens of modelers, and it's great that you show uh, a figure of a SMAP uh, satellite showing. Uh, I just have one quick question that because SMAP only show the very shallow soil moisture, and then in the, in the area, for example, you see a, a lot of uh, agricultural vegetated region that the plants can use a very deep zone of soil moisture. Wouldn't that act to like a more potential area where you see a greater cape build up uh, globally or regionally? Absolutely. And yeah, it's a very, very important point that you need to know not just the surface soil moisture, but the deep soil moisture. I don't know enough about soils to know over the long, like set seven year climatology, whether you know, there's a, cor a good correlation between those two variables. I just don't know. I sort of suspect there's some. OK, well, we're yeah. right on time. Well, thanks again, <laughs> Kerry. And okay. we're gonna con we will continue the conversation out here with the cookies and coffee. Thanks. <laughs>